have our final session for you, a special headliner taking us into this evening. It's considered to be one of three people most responsible for the advancement of deep learning from the 1990s and the year 2000s, with over 135,000 citations found by Google Scholar, an HA index of 125. I'm really pleased to say joining us from Canada via Skype is Joshua Bengio, the Professor of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal. Joshua is going to give us his thoughts on the challenges of deep learning towards AI. And then after Joshua's presentation via Skype, we'll do a Q&A and also a special announcement. More on that to come. But I'm hoping with the power of technology, Joshua, welcome. Hey. Good to see you. And uh, I'm going to give you a very warm welcome from our crowd here in Amsterdam. And I'll let you take over. All right, let's do screen sharing. Just a minute. So I'm going to tell you about what I perceive as some of the limitations of current research in AI and deep learning, uh, especially as it pertains to understanding and, uh, and in particular understanding language. Um, so you see my slides all right? Can you? Okay. Um, so you know, the main advances that have happened in the last few years in AI are mostly in the area of perception. So computers have made huge strides there. Uh, of course, this is uh, changing uh, uh, vehicles. This is... Uh, brave enough to do the... I thought it was just nice to hear uh, this is also uh, some progress in the ability of computers to manipulate language, for example, here to translate an image into a sentence um, and to play games. As you know, uh, the uh, champion uh, in the game of Go has been beaten by uh, a computer using deep learning. Um, also, the way that we even think about these uh, deep nets has changed from pattern recognition devices to systems that can actually be creative. So what you're seeing here are images of people um, that have been invented by the machine. These are not real people. They were not you know, uh, taken from some database. They were synthesized by these generative adversarial networks that we uh, initiated in 2014. And you see the progression over years as the quality of these uh, generated images has been improving. Um, Another uh, really important improvement that has happened in the last few years is due to the use of attention mechanisms, which are inspired by uh, human cognition, of course. And um, in our work on machine translation, we found that a particular form of attention mechanism, which we call content-based um, soft attention, made it possible to get much, much better results so what happens is that as the system is producing the next word in the translated sentence, it's using its attention mechanism to focus on one or a few words in the source sentence. And this, this ability to focus on just a few elements has been found to be useful in many areas. And transforming um, deep learning from, uh, again, uh, just processing vectors to processing any kind of data structure. It, the, the progress on um, machine translation has been pretty incredible. What you see in the bottom is uh, the quality of human evaluations, starting from the traditional engrams that were there, the standard before 2016, to when Google installed this in the Google Translate, uh, you know, approaching substantially the level of human um, quality translation. Now, all this is really great. And uh, we are amazed at the progress that has happened, but we have to keep uh, you know, our, our, um, uh, our heads cool because uh, in spite of all this, we're still very far from human level AI. And um, this is best um, seen when you look at the kinds of mistakes that these systems make. So for example, what I'm showing here are well-known um, so-called adversarial examples, where you tweak a little bit the image on the left to produce the image on the right, 
And instead of saying that uh, this is the image of a dog, the system would say it's an image of an ostrich, but it's been tweaked to produce that answer. Um, there are other settings that have been studied showing that the systems we're currently training, um, although they seem to be doing a good job on, on the data that we're training on, are not really capturing the sort of high level abstractions that humans rely on. Um, for example, if you ask them to classify or um, these sentences in order to decide what they refers to, like in the women stopped taking pills because they were pregnant, is they women or pills? Uh, if you change pregnant to carcinogenic, um, the answer changes. And humans are very good at answering these kinds of questions, but, but uh, current machine learning systems are barely better than chance. One thing that clearly is lacking in current AI is intuitive psychology and intuitive physics. The kinds of things that we don't really need to explain with language, but that babies and young children learn by themselves by observing the world and interacting with it. And you don't need to teach them these things. They, they just learn these things by themselves. And these are things that um, we know, but we can't, we don't have conscious access to, so we can't uh, talk about it, we can't explain it to computers, we can't program them to do these things. So, so when asking what is missing from current AI, and in particular, uh, trying to understand what would be needed for a machine to actually understand a question or understand a document, um, the central question I, I want to focus in on is what kind of knowledge is, is needed for this to happen? And then how is the computer going to acquire that knowledge? Now, a lot of um, current natural language processing in, in, in machine learning is based on training on tons and tons of data of, of mostly of text corpora, right? So large quantities of texts, uh, sometimes much more than a human could read in their whole lifetime. And yet they're still not understanding things nearly as well as we do. So to maybe get a glimpse of what is going on, I propose the following thought experiment. Imagine you're um, approaching another planet and you're gonna be observing the, the aliens on that planet and trying to figure out their language by looking at the bits of information that they're exchanging with each other, so their language. Now, um, this is actually what we do when we train a neural net to model texts. We're trying to figure out uh, the meaning of the text by, by uh, modeling the distribution of sequences of words. Now, on that planet, however, things are a bit different from Earth. Um, their communication channel is noisy. Um, sorry, their communication channel is not noisy, whereas, whereas um, our communication channel is noisy. And so, uh, like on Earth, on this planet, the, the bandwidth is expensive, so you want to minimize the number of bits that you're sending back and forth. And so the, the right way to do this is to compress the messages as much as possible. However, we know that if you can, if if you if you can compress a text, for example, or any kind of information uh, as much as possible, what you get is a sequence of bits that are that look like noise. They are independent. Um, they have uh, there, there is no information that you can recover by just looking at those bits of information that are uh, um, the result of compression. So. Um, so that's, that's a problem because even though on Earth we, we have noise in our communication channel, which is speech, and so there will be some redundancy in, in the words that we exchange, and so maybe there is some information there about meaning, uh, it's very likely that we're missing uh, some information about meaning just by observing lots and lots of texts. So how do we manage to uh, train a system to understand that alien language? Well, what we could do is, instead of just watching the um, signals that they exchange to communicate, we try to observe their behavior. So we try to figure out what their intentions are uh, and, and, and look at the context of, of the messages that they're exchanging. So now we have a bit more work to do. In addition to modeling the texts, we have to model uh, uh, the behavior of these aliens. We have to model their world. Uh, we have to understand the causal structure of, um, of their environment and, and, and of their intentions. This is a lot more work, but unfortunately, I think that's the only way we're going to build machines that understand these aliens. And similarly, I think we have to do 
this sort of uh, um, grounded language learning uh, uh, in order to understand, in order to have machines which understand human languages. So uh, that means uh, we need to spend a lot more effort on building machine learning systems that can understand their environment, which can understand how the world works, and, um, and then associate uh, the language, the, the sentences and so on, uh, with the context to which it refers to, to basically associate uh, the, for example, the objects in images with uh, the names of, of these objects in a sentence. But of course, much more than single, only the names, but also more complicated constructions and, and things that are happening in, in the world around us. So this is connected to um, an issue in, um, in machine learning. If you look at the progress we've made with deep learning, uh, it corresponds mostly to this uh, type of cognition called system one, um, which is the things you can do very quickly, like in half a second. That's mostly heuristic, unconscious, so you don't have access to you know why you're doing it and how you're doing it in detail, and and not linguistic. So the, the like how I recognize uh, an object in front of me isn't something I can I can uh, break down into pieces that I can then explain to a computer. Uh, but deep learning does these things very well. Uh, however, there's another kind of uh, cognitive processing called system two, uh, which corresponds more to what classical symbolic AI was trying to do. And that's the kind of thing that uh, takes us more time, uh, that's usually sequential. For example, if I ask you to add uh, two long, large numbers, uh, it's, it's, it's conscious, it's logical, it's linguistic, we can talk about it. Um, algorithms are like this, like it's a recipe we can describe and we can reason about. Um, so, so we are not doing as well right now in machine learning on system two types of tasks. But, but um, as far as language is concerned, of course, this, this is very important. So um, I think it's going to be really necessary in, in the future to combine uh, research on, on both systems now, um, as far as the part about building systems that understand our environment, there's really uh, a lot of excitement in recent years in reinforcement learning and other agent learning methods, which um, um, for now uh, is being tested and evaluated on virtual worlds, virtual environments like video games or these 3D worlds that people have built. Um, and the idea is that uh, we're not really trying to build a full understanding of the whole world, but to design learning algorithms uh, that can explore the environment, uh, try things, and, and learn from those experiments. And we can, we can test these algorithms on these simpler words, and we can have a fast research cycle. And then as we get better at it, uh, we, can, we can test these algorithms with more complex environments and eventually try this on, on real uh, world environments like robots. So um, I think what is going on right now with the kinds of mistakes that I showed you earlier that deep learning is doing is that uh, the current models cheat by looking at um, clues and some sort of uh, regularities like the, the backgrounds and the texture, but, but they don't work so well in uh, um, examples that look very different from the training data. Uh, whereas humans are very good at that, for example, you can project yourself, uh, if you read a science fiction novel, so you can project yourself if you were on the moon. And, um, and, and you, can, you can imagine what would be the consequences of being there, because you understand the causal mechanisms that govern uh, physics, say, of being in the moon. And so um, this is something that machine learning is starting to study, how to capture causality, but we're really not good at yet. Uh, and I think it's going to be really important to predict the future uh, far from the, the type of data that, that the machines have seen. Um, so in my group, we have started a project, which uh, I call the Baby AI Game Project, which is one of these uh, virtual environment uh, 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 benchmark where we're trying to test different reinforcement learning and agent learning and imitation learning, unsupervised learning methods, um, where the agent uh, is trying to understand its environment, but it's also able to interact with the human. And the human uh, is a player whose role is to help the, the baby learner to figure out its environment using natural language. 
So we've created an environment uh, where the baby has to uh, execute some missions, things like go to the red ball, open the door on your left, put a ball next to a purple door after you put the blue box next to a gray box and pick up the purple box. Whew. Well, um, even these very simple environments and simple missions are currently out of reach of the current machine learning. So uh, I think that there's, there's much that can be achieved by testing our methods on these simple grid worlds and eventually 3D environments before we actually try them on much more complex, uh, rich um, environments of the real world. Um, so to, to conclude, um, uh, I've tried to make a list, make a list of some of the uh, research directions which I think are going to be necessary to make substantial progress towards human level understanding. Um, so of course we, we're going to need uh, a lot more computing power because the models we're building are going to be big in proportion to how much knowledge needs to be compiled into them. And right now we're only training models that capture very small aspects of, of our reality. Um, also, in order for these uh, agents to be able to discover how the environment works, um, a lot of that is going to be unsupervised. They're going to be exploring their environment and discovering underlying causal factors and causal mechanisms. So we need progress on both of these aspects of machine learning. Uh, regarding language, we can't have these systems learn language um, in a way that's abstracted away from um, what language refers to. And that's why we need more research on grounded language learning. Um, these agents need to be like little scientists or, or children who are trying to understand their environment by testing ideas and hypotheses so as to quickly figure out how things work and discovering the relevant high-level concepts. Um, um, we also need to bring together the sort of classical AI or goals of uh, system to cognition with uh, the kinds of uh, deep learning representations that correspond to system one cognition that we have achieved in recent years. So that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, there, oh, there we go. Let me switch. Joshua, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the technology will mean that um, if you unfreeze from your presentation, we get to see you. Ah, yes, yes wonderful. Um, if it's okay with you, we've got a few minutes to open up questions to the floor, if that's okay. So yes, yes. if I can invite you to raise please. your hands if you'd like to ask Joshua a question, please do. Again, we've got our roving microphones here. Gentlemen, just here at the front. And anybody else, raise your hands, and I'll keep an eye on where the hands are. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, basically, uh, to be honest, you're the reason that I uh, buy the ticket to the conference. But uh, it's a He's pity the reason that's... you bought a ticket? Well, yes. Amazing. A big fan. <laughs> but uh, it's a pity that you cannot be here. But um, Sorry. my question would be um, for the reinforcement learning for um, that we train our, uh, our model on, uh, yeah. would you have like tips on how do we design the uh, the representation of those virtual environments for our model. You mean how we design the environments? Yeah, how so, we design so, the environment. Absolutely, yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, I think the um, important ingredients are um, compositionality. So, so the environment needs to have many different um, uh, factors and, 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 and mechanisms in it that can be combined in many ways to present a real challenge to the learning procedures. Otherwise, what happens in a lot of uh, reinforcement learning experiments uh, that seem to work quite well is that the, the agent just sort of learned by heart some solutions, like playing a particular game, and they find a trajectory that solves the game. But there is not much generalization. So we have to be really careful in setting up environments where the only way that the learner can uh, really learn is by, by being able to figure out the, the, the actual underlying mechanism to, to really understand. So they have to be tested in a way that's very different from their, their training data. And uh, so you need some sort of uh, compositional structure in the way that the environment is defined. Like, for example, I showed this environment with many different rooms and many different kinds of objects. And, and, and the missions involve combining different colors, different types, different positions, and so on. 
Lovely, thank you. Uh, we've run out of time, Benju, but um, before I let you go, I hope that's answered your question, by the way. Before I let you go, um, you're going to make a special announcement for us, I believe, at uh, this year's World Summit AI. And in order to do that, to prep that, I think it's only right that we have a drum roll. And DJ Sleeper, I set you that challenge this morning about a drum roll. So let's have a drum roll. Applause for the drum roll. <laughs> Love that. Over to you, Joshua. Well, so my announcement is very simple. The World Summit AI for North America is moving to Montreal next year. And I'm, I'm very glad uh, of this decision. Uh, as you uh, may know, Montreal is a hotbed of AI these days and uh, an amazing AI ecosystem both for research and for the uh, development of startups and, and, um, and industrial research. So welcome to Montreal next year. I'm so pleased to, um, to hear that. And I, I should just say, in addition, we're not quite taking over. In addition to what's happening in Europe, we are also holding uh, an event in the Americas as well. Um, how's the weather in Montreal around April time? Uh, well, it, it depends. It could be snowy or it could be uh, really nice spring days. Let's go for really nice for this yes. moment in time. Uh, just to say you're competing against Amsterdam, which is about 20 degrees Celsius here today. I do things in Celsius because I'm a Brit. Uh, ah, but but it, it was 26 today, uh, yesterday in Montreal. Oh, well, there we go. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much for sharing in that announcement. Oh, and we... I just want to add one thing. So, Absolutely. Uh, for those who want to learn more about uh, the Montreal ecosystem, tomorrow there's a panel a bit before four on, on uh, Montreal's ecosystem. So I encourage you to attend. Lovely, thank you. And uh, we will see you in April next year. Okay, bye. Joshua, thank you everybody. Please thank him.